Nothing is Nothing, Book One of Stories for Your Inner Child by Steve Gallegos. Nothing is nothing. Today, nothing is nothing, but who could have known? There was a time when something was something, when things were things, when words had meaning and meant definite things, when words had substance, were tangible, could be truly spoken and heard and understood. But that was then, and today is today. Things have changed since I was a child, thought David. When I learned something, I knew it, and I could talk about it. And mother would listen, and father would listen, and my aunt and uncle and cousins would listen. But not now. Now things are in a whirl. Nobody understands a thing I say. I speak, and they kind of look at me as if I were dumb or something. I don't understand anymore. What has happened? Maybe the world is changing, said Gordy, just like we grow and change, get bigger, need new clothes and nothing fits us anymore, shoes are too tight, sweater sleeves only come to the elbow, and buttons are missing. Before we even know it, we are different and nothing fits us anymore. And mother needs to buy us new clothes. Maybe that's the way the world is too. Maybe the world has grown and nothing fits it anymore, and we don't fit it anymore. It needs new kids that are more its size. Maybe that's what happens. But what do we do then, asked David, when our old clothes don't fit anymore? We give them away or throw them away or use them as rags. But how does that work for us? Will they throw us away or give us away or use us as rags now? Well, said Gordy, I heard something that's even scarier. I heard they send us away to a place where they make us different, where they force us to change, and if we don't change, we're worthless, like rags, like clothes that no longer fit in the world. They stretch us and make us skinny and change us to fit the world. But how do they do that, answered David, screwed up with worry. And certainly mother and dad wouldn't let them take us away, would they? And how could we ever be different from the way we are? We are who we are. That's something I definitely know. So how could we ever change? I don't know, answered Gordy, but there's something even scarier. Scarier than forcing us to be different? What could be scarier than that? Well, said Gordy, I've heard that they force one of us to hide and the other needs to learn to be just like every other kid. Oh my God, said David, how could that possibly be? And where would we hide? And how could we not be who we are? That just doesn't make any sense. That's what makes the world such a joy, so much fun. And we wake up so happy to be who we are. And we go on our adventures and discover new things and go swimming in the river and lie under the trees and smell the flowers and watch the bugs and find funny things to think about. How could we do that if we aren't who we are? That just doesn't make any sense. I know, said Gordy, but these are some of the things I've heard grown-ups talking about while you were asleep. When you sleep, I slink around and listen to what grown-ups talk about. They don't see me, so I can get real close and hear what they say to each other, but not to kids. And what they say is really scary. What could be scarier than being forced to be all alike? and having to be different from who we really are, and one of us having to hide. And who could tell us who to be? We're the only ones that know that. No one has the right to make us different. I don't understand how they can do that in the first place. I know, said Gordy, it doesn't make any sense, and I don't know what to think about it either. And when I hear grown-ups talking about those things, I try to ask them questions, but they don't pay any attention to me and just act as if I weren't even there. I know whenever I talk to you and they're around, they just look at me kind of strange, like they don't understand something. They kind of look uncomfortable and don't know what to say and won't talk about why they're uncomfortable. And it's a strange feeling like they do when they try to avoid saying something that they don't want me to hear, like they did before Jeremy was born and they didn't want me to know about him. It was curious and fascinating, and I wanted to know everything about it. Like, where did he come from? 
Where was he before he got into mother's belly? Why would nobody talk about it? What was so secret about it? Why wouldn't they answer my questions? David was lying under their favorite tree as he asked these questions. He was puzzled. He and Gordy had been the best of friends ever since he could remember and had always spoken about everything. And grown-ups seemed to be getting harder and harder to understand, seemed to whisper more, and looked uncomfortable when he would ask certain questions, and were ignoring Gordy more and more. Gordy didn't seem to mind. In fact, it gave him a certain kind of power, like he could go places and be invisible and come back and tell David about it, especially times when David was asleep and he didn't seem to need the recognition that David needed just as long as he and David remained friends. And of course they would always be friends. They both knew that. Next chapter. The Senseless Experiment You've been away, said David. Yes, I usually do when you're asleep, but I always tell you where I've been once you wake up again, answered Gordy. Have I been asleep long this time? I never do really know when I fall asleep. And since I've been going to school, I seem to fall asleep easier and easier. Yes, it's been a long trip for me, but I've had many adventures and learned much. Good, I look forward to hearing your stories. And I also love it when I can go with you. Yes, those are good adventures, but come with me now. You don't have any obediences you've got to perform, do you? Since you've been in school, there's less and less of you available. You're always obeying somebody else's words, and that doesn't leave much of you, said Gordy. I seem to get so easily trapped, said David. As soon as one of the big people starts talking, I just get dragged away, and I don't even realize I'm gone. Yes, I've watched it happen, and I try to get your attention, but they have a hold on you that is stronger. I'm afraid one of these times you won't come back at all. Now that's scary, said David, and the scariest part is that I don't even know it's happening. The big people taught me that I have to pay attention, and when I do, I seem to disappear. And if I don't pay attention, then they hurt me in some way. Sounds to me like you're paying with your life, and there is little in return, said Gordy. Or like this attention place is a trap or a prison where you belong to someone else and not to who you are. It is a narrow place where there's not much leeway. I feel like I'm dragged away, away from who I really am, and am being trained to act as if I were someone else, a dummy, or a puppet imitation of the big person who drags me. Well, come with me now. There's no one around right now who could grab you. Come, come. Gordy takes David by the hand and leads him onto a path that is suddenly a path through the woods. David breathes deeply. The air is good and fresh, alive with everything that's growing around them. There are old trees and herbs and plants and flowers and grasses, all moist with freshness and alive with their own essences. David's step is springier, and he feels his own aliveness throughout his whole body, as if every cell were suddenly waking up. They both begin to laugh. My God, I haven't laughed in a good while, says David. School is such a serious place. There's no room to laugh and nothing to laugh about. It must be dreadful, answers Gordy. Look, there's a monkey in that tree, and he's watching us. Let's go talk to him. Hello, monkey. You can't talk to animals, says David. Of course you can. Do you see someone saying we can't? No, but I think immediately, what if a big person knew? They would try to hurt me. Well, good thing they aren't here then, isn't it? Hello, monkey. How are you today? It looks like fun being able to climb trees so easily. Monkey looks at them both and says, You don't come here very often anymore. I've missed you. Come with me. And at that invitation, both David and Gordy find themselves up in the trees, swinging through the branches with Monkey 
and enjoying it tremendously. They feel free and capable, able to do things that they didn't think they could do. Where are you taking us, asks David. You'll see, you'll see, answers Monkey. They continue to swing through the trees and the trees get taller. The forest is giant now and they're high above the ground. As they look down, they can see a clearing in the forest and there's a circle of animals in it. The circle of animals are all looking up at them as if waiting for their arrival. They reach a tree on the edge of the clearing and Monkey begins to climb down it. David and Gordy follow him. When they arrive at the circle, they're astounded to see how big some of the animals are, for they all looked rather small from up above. Most noticeable is a giant elephant who reaches out his trunk to them both and touches each gently with it in greeting and welcome. Although no words are spoken, they can both feel the elephant's warm welcome. Next in the circle is a fine brown horse, full of energy, snorting and impatient, ready for action, yet standing patiently in the circle. The horse stamps his front foot and snorts at them. Next to him there's a large bird. David thinks it's an eagle, but it is larger than any bird he has ever seen before. It looks at them both with a piercing eye and seems to look right into them as if it could see right through their skin into the inside. And then a snake, all coiled up and sly looking, slowly sticks out his tongue and retracts it, and moves so slowly that they don't really know if it's moving at all. Looking at them with fine beady eyes is a porcupine, and they don't know if they can trust it or not, for its spikes look sharp and sudden. And then there's an animal that neither has ever seen before, and initially they can't seem to make it out. There's something ghostly about it, translucent, transparent, insubstantial, yet vibrating with its own presence, and they can both feel it, even though they have difficulty seeing it, or at least placing it among the animals that they know. Elephant speaks to them in a deep, rumbling voice, and they can feel as well as hear what it says. Welcome to the council. We've been waiting for you. All the other animals either nod or acknowledge them in some way, and they both see that Monkey has taken a place in the circle, being also one of the animals who have waited. We were afraid that we had lost you, says Elephant. So we sent Monkey to find you. It is important that you come to recognize that you have a place here with us and that we need you and you need us. Without each other, none of us can be fully alive. And yet aliveness is the finest gift that the universe grants us. Without aliveness, nothing else really has value. We cannot be really alive without your participation here with us. And whether you realize it or not, you cannot be really alive without our presence in your life. The big people have been trying to take you away from us for a while now. They do it out of ignorance because they have also left their own inner counsels. And if you are in full aliveness, they feel threatened by you. So they spend years trying to ensure that you keep us hidden and forget we are here. I don't understand, says David. Right now it is not a matter of understanding, but of experiencing our presence and your own aliveness, answers Elephant. Understanding will come later. Understanding always follows experience and cannot precede it. If it precedes experience, then it's a false understanding, a sham, a fantasy, a make-believe. That is why you get so lost in school. They drag you away into a pretend understanding and you have no place to stand in your aliveness. You must first stand in your aliveness and then everything else goes on top of that. If you try to pile it up differently, then any little earthquake of an idea can topple it all. Wow, says David, now things seem to be making sense. 
next chapter, in school. Back in school the next day, David was in a different space. He wasn't quite at school. He kept thinking about the animals that he had met with Gordy, and sometimes one of them would speak to him and sometimes another. They always surprised him when they spoke, because he wasn't expecting it. It began before he was even at school. As soon as he woke up, Elephant was there saying, Now it's time to get up. Very softly, and without the usual jangle of the alarm clock, or his mother's sharp voice telling him that he would be late. It seemed so easy this morning, and Elephant even nudged him gently with his trunk, like a caring hug, and David was standing up. He had usually tried to stay in bed longer, especially when the alarm clock suddenly jangled him awake. He hated that noise of the alarm, and usually hit at it to shut it up, and by the time his mother would call him, he was half asleep again, and angry at her for not letting him sleep longer. But Elephant had been so gentle with his soft, deep voice and his caring touch that David was standing up without effort and shut off the alarm clock before it even began to jangle. He went to the bathroom and was brushing his teeth when his mother looked in on him and let out a sudden breath, as if she were surprised at what she saw. Instead of telling him he would be late, she just said good morning and went back to the kitchen. David finished dressing and knew exactly what clothes he would wear. It seemed so easy, and as he made his way to the kitchen, the house was quieter than usual, softer in some way, and he moved easier. He also was quieter inside than usual, and even though he expected his mother to say something to hurry him, she didn't, but instead looked at him with wide eyes and poured him a glass of orange juice and finished frying his egg. She put it on a plate with toast and butter and placed it in front of him at the table. David noticed that Elephant was standing softly just behind him and had it placed his trunk gently on David's shoulder. This felt warm and comforting, and David remembered how he used to love to sit in his mother's lap when he was younger and smaller. But that was before Jeremy was born. When Jeremy was born, the house seemed suddenly to be more crowded, and there wasn't as much room for David nor did he hear soft words any more from his father or his mother. But strangely enough, he realized it was the presence of elephant in the room that gave him more space now. He noticed how easily elephant moved and how graceful he was. There was no effort to his movements, and as soon as David had finished his breakfast, elephant began to move and David moved with him, carrying his empty plate to the sink and washing it in the soapy water. Why did his mother look at him in such surprise and say, thank you? He didn't understand as she gently put her arm on his shoulder and told him she loved him. This was so different from her usual hurry to have him leave, and he calmly took his book bag and walked out the door. Elephant was with him the whole time, and David felt that somehow Elephant made more room for him to be in the world. He was in a strangely different frame of mind as he walked to school. Always before he had been hurried and irritated at having to hurry, but today Elephant was by his side, pointing to the trees along the way and nudging each one gently with his trunk. So David also touched each tree with his hand as they passed. These are your ancient, ancient grandparents, said Elephant. David was surprised to hear this. But my grandparents are dead, he blurted out. Your human grandparents may be gone, or in a different form, but these were the first giants on the earth, and they're still your grandparents. But don't be so surprised, they're my grandparents as well. These are the first giants that populated the land, and they brought their aliveness onto the earth. It was a great journey, for they need to be respected for what they did. If they hadn't come out onto the earth, you and I may still be swimming in the sea, Elephant said with a wink and a smile. 
David listened to him but did not know whether to take him seriously or not. But by then they were at the schoolyard and David said hello to some of the boys and girls that were in his class. They didn't notice Elephant and David didn't say a word about him, but Elephant was always present and frequently put his trunk lovingly on David's shoulder. David felt different with his strong and relaxed companion, and David noticed that Elephant was very aware of the entire situation at school, of all the other students, of the space, of the building and rooms, but most of all David realized that Elephant was very aware of being present with David, and it felt good. Throughout the day, David felt different. Always before, he would get fidgety, but today he was relaxed and settled and didn't worry about getting called on by the teacher. Curiously enough, although the teacher kept looking at him, he never once called upon him. David would almost swear that the teacher was somehow afraid of him. The entire day, Elephant stood proud but relaxed next to David and always looked directly at the teacher, almost as if challenging him. When the school bell rang, it was time to go home. David could hardly believe the day was over already and felt good and alive and ready to leave the stuffy classroom and go outside. On the way home, David was full of questions. But first of all, he thanked Elephant for being with him and told him how much he cared about him and asked if Elephant would come to school with him every day. Elephant said, yes, of course he would, that he was there for David and cared for him and was his presence. David didn't quite know what to make of this last statement, but he had learned to trust Elephant, and he knew that Elephant had made a vast difference that day at school. It felt like the teacher knew Elephant's presence even though he couldn't see him. And when David asked him about it, Elephant replied that the teacher was a mouse. That evening after supper, David went to bed a bit earlier than usual, which surprised his mother, as David usually tried to stay up as late as he could. And as soon as he was in bed, Gordy was there, and Elephant said it was time to go back to the clearing and to visit with the circle of animals again. David was thrilled to hear this. Next chapter, The Evening Council. No sooner had David laid his head on the pillow than he found himself going along the path to the woods with Gordy. He was surprised that Elephant wasn't with them, since he had been with David all day. When he asked Gordy about this, Gordy said that Elephant was already in the clearing and had gone ahead to visit with the other animals before he and David got there. Now David was aware that his own parents couldn't see Gordy, even though when he was small he had thought they could, because they would ask about Gordy and were interested to hear what David had to tell about him. But recently they even acted annoyed whenever David spoke about him. So David had begun to say less and less about him. And whenever his parents were around, David even pretended that Gordy didn't exist. He realized that talking about Gordy made his parents nervous, and he didn't want to make them uncomfortable. He smiled when he wondered what they would say if he told them about Elephant, and about the fact that Elephant had spent a whole day at school with him. By now they were approaching the clearing, and David could hear the animals were talking with each other, and saw that they were huddled together in the middle of the large space. They were involved in an active discussion and didn't notice David and Gordy's arrival, and David didn't understand what they were talking about. Suddenly they all gathered around David and began asking him questions. It felt quite strange because up to now very few people had wanted to know about David. His parents and teachers were usually full of suggestions about what he should do and how he should be, and this always felt strange because they acted as if they knew what was good for David, but without ever getting to know him. But the animals were definitely interested in getting to know David, and David was also interested in getting to know these animals better. The first one to speak was Snake, 
and David felt a shudder when Snake looked at him. It felt like Snake could look right through him, and he didn't really want to be seen so closely. It felt like the way his mother looked at him when she had something in mind that she wasn't saying. There was something sneaky about it, and uncomfortable, and David felt himself wanting to withdraw. But David also realized he didn't know Snake. David looked at Elephant, and Elephant just pointed with his trunk and said, Just tell Snake what you're feeling. David said, Snake, I feel uncomfortable when you look at me. I feel you think you know something that I'm not supposed to know. It's the same way my mother sometimes makes me feel. Snake smiled and said, Why don't you tell your mother about it when she makes you feel that way? David was surprised to hear this, and he thought his mother would get flustered and uncomfortable if he said that. Oh, said Snake, but it's okay for you to be flustered and uncomfortable, but you're not to make others feel that way. Do you always protect other people from feeling the things that you're uncomfortable feeling? David was shocked to hear this. It was something he had never thought about before. He realized that he hid his own discomfort, but perhaps he also helped other people to hide their own. But it was also a relief to see this, and he suddenly felt much more comfortable with Snake. And he saw that Snake was smiling and said to him, Snake, thank you for helping me to see that. Even though I had been doing it, I wasn't aware of it. Snake said, You're welcome. It's good to be aware, especially of those things that make us uncomfortable. And sometimes it's good even to talk about them. David knew that the next time he felt such a thing around his mother, he would talk to her about it and see what happened. Now the animals all cheered, and each one hugged David, and he felt he was with a group of old friends who really cared about him. He felt warm and supported, and easily fell asleep in bed. Next chapter, The Following Morning. The following morning, David woke up quite early. I'm fully awake already, he remarked to himself. He smiled, pleased, and then noticed Elephant looking at him. Did you wake me up, he asked Elephant, like you did yesterday? Elephant said, no, you woke up on your own. Maybe it's time to get up. Maybe you'd rather be awake than asleep. Yes, thought David to himself, it feels good to be awake. And it's good to see you here with me, he said to Elephant. Yes, replied Elephant, I like being with you too. David felt good and tingly all over. It's good to be alive, he thought. With that, he sprang out of bed, showered and brushed his teeth, combed his hair and got dressed. He went to the kitchen, expecting his mother to be preparing breakfast, but she wasn't there. Maybe she's still asleep, he thought. And then the idea hit him. I'll fix breakfast for her this morning. He took the orange juice out of the fridge and set plates and glasses on the kitchen table put bread in the toaster, got the butter out and the marmalade and the milk, and put several boxes of cereal on the table. It felt good to be preparing breakfast. He had never done that before, and Mother would be surprised when she got up. Just then, David's father walked into the kitchen. David was surprised because he had only been thinking about his mother, and he hadn't expected his father at all. Father looked at him suspiciously and said, what are you feeling guilty about that you're up so early this morning? David felt something stick in his throat. This was not at all what he had been expecting. He stumbled over his words and didn't know how to answer his father. So admit it, his father said. You've been up to something. David didn't know what to say. His father's words were so unexpected and strange, although he recognized the attitude. His father frequently blamed him for things that he had never done. In fact, things that he had never even thought of doing. It felt like his father wanted him to feel guilty about something. David felt himself freeze. And then he realized Elephant's trunk was resting on his shoulder. And he turned and asked Elephant, What's going on here? What should I say? What should I do? Breathe, Elephant replied. 
and David recognized that he had been holding his breath ever since Father had first entered the kitchen. David breathed deeply and exhaled. Then he replied to his father, I'm not feeling guilty about anything. I woke up early and wanted to fix breakfast for Mother and for you. Father had a way of looking at David that made him uncomfortable. But David realized that his father was surprised to hear him answer. David usually didn't know what to say and frequently didn't answer a thing. David realized that father himself was surprised at David's answering back and that father now was the one who didn't know what to say. Wasn't that interesting? Sit down and have some orange juice, David said to his father. Mother should be up soon. Just then, Mother walked through the kitchen door and gave David a great big smile and said, Oh, you're up early. You must be growing up. You got up on your own yesterday, too. Then she looked at her husband and said, Dear, you fixed breakfast. How thoughtful of you. David and his father looked at each other and neither said a word. They all ate breakfast and Mother made some coffee and David left for school, still puzzled. He was happy to have Elephant walking to school with him. Elephant, I don't understand why my father says the things he does. He always thinks I've done something wrong, and I don't understand why he does that. And today he knew I was the one who had fixed breakfast, but he didn't say it. Neither did you, said Elephant. You could have told your mother that you had fixed breakfast, but why didn't you? Why not? I don't know. I often don't know what to say when my father's around. But why didn't he say? Elephant's answer shocked David. Maybe he's not the grown-up. Maybe he's not the grown-up, David repeated to himself. What a strange thought. But father was grown-up. He's bigger and older, Elephant said. But maybe he's not grown-up inside. Such a thought had never entered David's mind before, and he was shocked to hear it. Is it possible that people were different inside from how they were outside? And if father was not grown up inside, what did that mean? Elephant, help me to understand. Does that mean inside he's still a little boy? Maybe he's even younger than you. What if he were a little boy? What would he look like? How would he act? How does he act? The answer came in a flash. He acts like a bully. He acts like he's jealous of me. He acts like he'd rather I weren't there. All of these thoughts were strange to David, but they were thoughts that were coming from him, and they also seemed to be telling the truth. These are thoughts that had never before been in his head, and there was something good about having them. There was a kind of relief an understanding of something that had never before made sense. What if people are really different ages inside? I only look at the outside, and I think that's who the person is. But what if, what if the inside doesn't match the outside? David was quiet for the rest of the walk to school, but inside he was very busy. Something seemed to be growing inside him, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing the world, a way that was new to him. He looked at Elephant and recognized that no one knew that Elephant was with him at home, in school, and that other people also didn't see what he was like on the inside. They looked at him and only saw a boy, but inside there was something very interesting going on. He needed to start seeing people on the inside and not only on the outside. David was very excited when he arrived at the school building.